Greetings, everyone. Saludos y bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Notice the same coffee cup, change of decor. Uh, it's really amazing to welcome you all to the start of our community of the imagination. I'll just say a few tiny words about what we're doing here. The here in quotes, maybe, because it's so different from our usual here. Um, it's been a difficult year, that would be an understatement, a year of death, a year of loss, a, week, a year of fear, and um, for everyone, no matter how safe, a year of pretty crushing uncertainty, I would say. Um, Under the Volcano has existed for 18 years, and we've created uh, a pretty amazing ongoing community of writers from around the world. I'm speaking in English, and please forgive me, those of you who uh, will find it a bit cumbersome, voy a decir casi todo lo que pueda en los dos idiomas, pero para ganar tiempo estamos hablando mayormente hoy en inglés. Una disculpa para nuestros hispanohablantes. Eh, quiero decir para empezar que a pesar de las dificultades, despite the challenges, we were committed all along even as we were in a state of shock to keeping Under the Volcano alive. And thinking about community, al pensar en cómo mantener esta comunidad, que iba a ser virtual, ya lo sabíamos desde abril del año pasado, um, we had this idea to make it a community of the imagination. Why? Because writers always are digging into our imaginations, but this year has meant everyone has been challenged in the world really to imagine and keep imagining and on a daily basis imagine that there is going to be another day and to keep going despite a much grief and we know in our own community how much there's been and i'm sure all of you have been touched uh closely by by loss and by fear this year so um the idea is to create a conversation in which imagination is the main character. And this conversation will take place over the whole month of April, starting today, which rest of April, uh, bringing together people whose work takes imagination uh, very far and very deep and very wide and will continue to do so and work that we uh, are nourished by and which we admire. So to bring all these voices into, the into this conversation, I reached out to colleagues. Some of the presenters this weekend and in the coming weeks have been faculty at Under the Volcano, and we're thrilled to have them back in the fold. And some are new, and we welcome them. Uh, I don't want to be the voice that you keep on hearing, <laughs> so I'm going to plunge straight in. Y este, quiero presentar antes a mi colega Gabriela Damián, que va a decir unas palabras de bienvenida en español específicamente para los oyentes eh, desde México y otros países hispanohablantes. Gaby. Hola, buenos días. Eh, agradecemos mucho su presencia aquí, eh, agradecemos mucho su confianza en el programa y sobre todo su voluntad de imaginar. Eh, precisamente a partir del de año tan duro que vivimos el, el año pasado y que este pareciera ser una prolongación de aquel, eh, Consideramos necesario generar esta clase de conversaciones donde la imaginación sea el centro, donde el poder de la palabra ligado al poder de nuestra capacidad para imaginar y para resistir a estas eh, circunstancias que, eh, que se nos están presentando, no solo la pandemia, sino eh, el deterioro de la naturaleza, eh, la conciencia de cómo estamos habitando este planeta, etcétera, etcétera, eh, pues es tremendamente urgente que entre nosotros revaloremos el poder de la palabra y eh, para ello también eh, revalorar el poder del conocimiento. Por eso tenemos aquí eh, a personalidades que honran ambas instancias. Eh, porque, como decía Úrsula Le Guin, eh, la ciencia explica y la poesía implica. Y eso es lo que pues, queremos hacer con estas conversaciones. Muchas gracias y disfrútenlo. Los dejo con Magda Bogin, la querida directora de nuestro programa, para que conduzca todas las delicias que tenemos por delante hoy. Beautiful, Gaby. Gracias de nuevo. 
Uh, I think I have to try to quickly retranslate that quote from Ursula Le Guin because it is so perfect as a preamble to what we're attempting to do today, which was, uh, I believe, science explains and poetry implies. Correct me, Gabi, if I got it wrong. Uh, but um, I just want to add this one uh, housekeeping uh, indication to everyone who's in our audience, a reminder to please keep your microphones off throughout the presentations and, um, and your video as well, so that the spotlight as it moves from presenter to presenter will fill your screen with these wonderful voices and presences. So again, a reminder to everyone who's in the audience, please turn off your camera and your audio and enjoy the program. Uh, with that, I want to introduce our poets. Why are we beginning with an invocation by leading poets of the United States? I would dare to say the leading poets of the United States, um, because poets, perhaps more than any other writers, uh, have a kind of sixth sense. They have their ear to the virtual ground and the real ground and the metaphorical ground. They have their ear to the universe, to the sky, and they observe and they see uh, so deeply and so widely. And so um, also because this is an occasion that feels almost in need of some kind of benediction because we have suffered so much and so long and a bit of inspiration in our sales as we go forward and because I know our audience is mostly composed of writers who are just joining under the volcanoes master classes which begin on Monday we begin with poets so first of all I want to say also uh, these people have published so much won so many awards that the entire program would be taken up by a recitation of their accomplishments, I either had the choice to be speechless with awe or to be concise. And there's much more information about each of them and um, their publications on our website. I urge you to go there and I certainly urge you to read them uh, in your own good time. I'm going to just give you a quick bio of each of them uh, before they begin so that the poetry will flow without interruption. Now, we seem not to have with us, unfortunately, uh, Cyrus Cassells, who was supposed to connect from Hawaii, he may uh, show up at some point, but we're going to go straight now to the poet Ilya Kaminsky. And I will just say a couple of uh, words about Ilya, whose life has been so extraordinary and his passage uh, from his native language into English as well, rather extraordinary. Ilya was born in Odessa when it was still the Soviet Union and lost most of his hearing at the age of four. His family was granted political asylum in the United States in 1998 and settled in Rochester, New York. After his father's death, so soon after that, he began to write poems in English and Ilya of that, that decision or that motion, that gravitation has said that he chose English because no one in my family or friends knew it. No one I spoke to could read what I wrote. I myself did not know the language. It was a parallel reality, an insanely beautiful freedom. It still is. Those are the words of Ilya Kaminsky. His most recent collection is Deaf Republic, an extraordinary reimagination of a community in Odessa, uh, which was named the New York Times Notable Book for that year, 2019, and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry in 2020. Ilya Kaminsky lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife, Katie Farris. The next poet after Ilya to read is going to be Rita Dove. She received the Pulitzer Prize, and I don't mean to laugh, it's just such a list, Rita. Uh, in, in, she received the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry in 1987. I have massively condensed this list. She was US Poet Laureate. Uh, in the early 90s to the mid 90s. She's the author of a novel, a short story collection, a book of essays, and 10 books of poetry. In 1996, she received the National Humanities Medal from President Clinton, and in 2011, the National Medal of Arts from President Obama, the only poet ever to receive both of those uh, huge uh, awards. Um, 
there's just absolutely too much to list here, uh, but I want to say that um, her most recent books, after 10, uh, the most recent uh, poetry collection is Sonata Mulatica, which is a treatise, it says, um, based on the life of the 19th century violin prodigy who was Afro-European, George Bridge Tower. Some of you may know the famous Kreutzer Sonata. It was written for George Bridgewater and later dedicated uh, to Kreutzer. Uh, quite a story. And um, I do have to send you back to our webpage to read more about Rita Dove, but I also send you to your favorite independent bookstore to buy her works. Um, Rita Dove now is uh, the Hoynes Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Virginia, where she's been teaching since 1989. And please don't think that she is sitting there in um, Virginia resting on her laurels because her next volume of poems, Playlist for the Apocalypse, is forthcoming from Norton this summer. And she's also got a new song cycle uh, written with composer Richard Daniel Poor that is due for, due for its premiere. Uh, I think in 2022. Um, that's enough for me. I give the floor to our two poets, first Ilya and then Rita Dove with no interruptions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Magda, uh, for, for making this community happen. It's really an honor to be a part of this community today, and I'm grateful. And it's especially an honor for me to read today with Rita, who is an absolute hero of mine and has been for many, many years. And also in this room being Carolyn, who has been my teacher since I was a teenager. So uh, I feel like I'm in a room with real giants and I'm gonna be really quickly here. Um, the poem I'll read is called Author's Prayer. Mm. Author's Prayer. Uh, you know what? Um, I'm going to put a little link in the chat because I read with an accent. And that way, if people want to follow the text of the poem, it's in the chat right now. Okay. So, author's prayer. If I speak for the dead, I must leave this animal of my body. I must write the same poem over and over for an empty page is a white flag of their surrender. If I speak for them, I must walk on the edge of myself. I must leave the blind man who runs through the rooms without touching the furniture. Yes, I live. I can cross the streets just in what is it? I can dance in my sleep and laugh in front of the mirror. Even sleep is a prayer, Lord. I will praise your madness. And in a language, not mine, speak of music that wakes us. Music in which we move. For whatever I say is a kind of petition. And the darkest days. Master, praise. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ilya, it is such a joy to be able to read with you and to be here with Carolyn. Magda, thank you for making all of this happen. And uh, for all of you out there, all of the writers, uh, it is indeed a community of the imagination. And I feel really enlivened and buoyed knowing that we are all out there. I'm going to read a medley of poems. I thought about the community of the imagination. I thought that these were poems which spoke to each other over the years. And so without interruption, without titles. Back when the earth was new and heaven just a whisper. Back when the names of things hadn't had time to stick. Back when the smallest breezes melted summer into autumn, when all the poplars quivered sweetly in rank and file. The world called and I answered. Each glance ignited to a gaze. I caught my breath and called that life 
swooned between spoonfuls of lemon sorbet. I was pirouette and flourish. I was filigree and flame. How could I count my blessings when I didn't know their names? Back when everything was still to come, luck leaked out everywhere. I gave my promise to the world and the world followed me here. Imagine you wake up with a second chance. The blue jay hawks his pretty wares and the oak still stands spreading glorious shade. If you don't look back, the future never happens. How good to rise in sunlight in the prodigal smell of biscuits, eggs and sausage on the grill. The whole sky is yours to write on, blown open to a blank page. Come on, shake a leg. You'll never know who's down there frying those eggs if you don't get up and see. This is for the woman with one black wing perched over her eye. Lovely Frida, erect among parrots in the stern petticoats of the peasant who painted herself a present. Wildflowers entwining the plastic corset her spine resides in, that flaming pillar, this priestess in the romance of mirrors. Each night she lay down in pain and rose to the celluloid butterflies of her beloved dead, Lenin and Marx and Stalin arrayed at the footstead, and rose to her easel the hundred dogs panting like children along the graveled walks of the garden. Diego's love, a skull in the circular window of the thumbprint searing her immutable brow. Everybody who's anybody longs to be a tree or ride one, hair blown to froth. That's why horses were invented and saddles tooled with singular stars. This is why we braid their harsh manes as if they were children, why children might fear a carousel at first for the way it insists that life is round. No, we reply, there is music and then it stops. The beautiful is always rising and falling. We call and the children sing back one more time. In the tree, the luminous sap ascends. Air, breathe me in. Take this thick heartache, this wily gelatinous yearning and make me everywhere a nothingness. I will be without boundaries then, an infestation of humors, invisible companion, ageless like a child. No one will be able to avoid me. Now I'm speechless. Thank you both for this extraordinary introduction leading us in to the next portion of this presentation. Uh, Rita Dove, Ilya Kaminsky, uh, we are all enriched by having just heard you. Uh, in the next section of this, this day, uh, I'm going to be speaking with the poet Carolyn Forche and the Mexican writer Elena Poniatowska, tendré el honor de presentar ahora a la poeta Carolyn Fourche de Estados Unidos y a la escritora y periodista Elena Poniatowska de México. So what we're planning to do here, because Carolyn is a poet first and a memoirist perhaps second or at any rate soon, most recently, and um, can add her own poetic voice now as, as we segue into the next part of our conversation. Carolyn Fourche. I suppose I need to read your bio. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have everything ready. It's just that I don't want to hear the sound of my own voice, but I do want the audience to know 
who's who. Uh, Carolyn Forche uh, was recognized very early. She's even said perhaps too early uh, with her first volume of poetry, Gathering the Tribes, winner of the Yale series of Younger Poets Prize. And after that, she's written four other books, all uh, extraordinary, essential, uh, the last one being In the Lateness of the World, which came out uh, just now uh, in um, 20, well, 2020, last year, uh, a book that got born into the pandemic and is in a way a companion book to What You Have Heard is True, her memoir that was released the year before um, both prize-winning books already and sort of compulsory reading for people who care about the things we are all here to care about, namely uh, the importance of the word, the beauty of poetry, witnessing, being alive to our moment, and perhaps as we'll momentarily hear, uh, allowing in the voices of others to our own work. Uh, I'm going to say just a brief uh, biographical word about Carolyn. All of her incredible number of awards are listed on our website, but she um, was one of the first poets to receive the, the relatively new Wyndham Campbell Prize uh, from Yale, uh, which is an extraordinary honor and um, is currently university professor at Georgetown University uh, I hope I've got that right, and lives in or near Washington, D.C. Uh, then we're going to be hearing about Elena Poniatowska, who is, um, again, one of these uh, writers whose, whose life work is impossible to summarize here, um, author of probably dozens of books by now, thousands of articles. Elena Poniatowska is one of Latin America's and Mexico's greatest living writers. It's not just me saying that, but she was recognized in 2014 as the winner of Spain's Cervantes Prize for Lifetime Literary Achievement. El Premio Cervantes en 2014 es como el Premio Nobel en Español para un escritor, una escritora. And uh, Elena has been a prolific journalist as well as a writer of fiction with parallel careers in both and has pioneered the genre that has inspired so many other writers alongside her, known as Novela Testimonio, which we will talk about shortly. Es novela de, um, de muchas voces, novela documental, tal vez you might also call it documentary writing. Among her best known works, probably, and um, it, certainly not the only ones to be mentioned, uh, Massacre at Tlatelolco, a kind of montage oral history of the student massacre in Mexico in 1968 and Hasta no verte Jesús mío uh, in quotes an autobiographical novel in fact a work of fiction in which the narrator is a soldadera or a camp follower from the Mexican revolution telling her life story to an invisible uh, listener which of course we know is Elena Poniatowska uh, at 89 it's not a secret about her age. She will tell you herself. She continues to write a weekly column for the Mexican newspaper La Jornada. And although French was her first language, as she will probably also tell you, uh, she's working on the third volume of a trilogy of novels based on the Polish side of her ancestors. So those are my brief introductions to these two amazing writers. They've never uh, appeared on the stage together. And so let's welcome them both uh, to our community of the imagination. Carolyn, I'm back to you for reading poetry. And after that, I hope we have the gift of Elena reading a short extract of her own writing in Spanish. Thank you, Magda. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Gracias por estar aquí. I'm going to read one poem. Um, I'm very, very happy to hear the work again of Ilia and Rita. And it's a deep honor for all of us to be with Elenia Poniatowska. My poem is called The Museum of Stones. These are your stones, assembled in matchbox and tin, collected from roadside culvert and viaduct, battlefield, threshing floor, basilica, abattoir. 
stones loosened by tanks in the streets from a city whose earliest map was drawn in ink on linen, schoolyard stones in the hand of a corpse, pebble from Baudelaire's we, oui. stone of the mind within us, carried from one silence to another. Stone of Cromlech and Cairn, schist and shale, hornblende, agate, marble, millstones, ruins of choirs and shipyards, chalk, marl, mudstone from temples and tombs, stone from the silvery grass near the scaffold, stone from the tunnel lined with bones, lava of a city's entombment, stones chipped from lighthouse, cell wall, scriptorium, paving stones from the hands of those who rose against the army, stones where the bells had fallen, where the bridges were blown. Those that had flown through windows, weighted petitions, feldspar, rose courts, blue schist, niece and chert, fragments of an abbey at dusk, sandstone toe of a Buddha mortared at Bamiyan, stone from the hill of three crosses and a crypt, from a chimney where storks cried like human children, stones newly fallen from stars, a stillness of stones, a heart, altar and boundary stone, marker and vessel, first cast load and hail, bridge stones and others to pave and shut up with, stone apple, stone basil, beech berry, stone break, concretion of the body, as blind, as cold, as deaf, all earth a quarry, all life a labor, Stone-faced, stone drunk with hope that this assemblage of rubble taken together would become a shrine or holy place, an ossuary, immovable and sacred, like the stone that marked the path of the sun as it entered the human dawn. Okay, thank you. Carolyn, did you say too? Can we be greedy? Um, well, um, I could read The Boatman, which is a poem of, about refugees, which is very much an issue of our time. These refugees are those from the other side of the world, making their way from Iraq, from, um, from Afghanistan, from Syria. This refugee is fleeing Syria and he makes his way through the Aegean. I meet him much later in Milwaukee when several times he picked me up in his taxi and gave me a ride one winter. And finally we realized that we had coincidentally met several times and he, we sat in a snowfall and he told me his story on the condition that I would report his story. And I was thinking I would write something in prose, but it, it came in a poem. <clears throat> the Boatman. We were 31 souls, he said, in the gray sick of sea, in a cold rubber boat, rising and falling in our filth. By morning, this didn't matter. No land was in sight. All were soaked to the bone, living and dead. We could still float, we said, from war to war. What lay behind us but ruins of stone, piled on ruins of stone. City called mother of the poor, surrounded by fields of cotton and millet. City of jewelers and cloak makers with the oldest church in Christendom and the sword of Allah. If anyone remains there now, they would be utterly alone. There is a hotel named for it in Rome, 
200 meters from the Piazza di Spagna, where you can have breakfast under the portraits of film stars. There, the staff cannot do enough for you. But I am talking nonsense again, as I have since that night we fetched a child, not ours from the sea drifting face down in a life vest, its eyes taken by fish or the birds above us. After that, Aleppo went up in smoke and Raqqa came under a rain of leaflets warning everyone to go. Leave, yes, but go where? We lived through the Americans and Russians, through Americans again, many nights of death from the clouds, mornings surprised to be waking from the sleep of death, still unburied and alive with no safe place. Leave, yes, we'll obey the leaflets, but go where? To the sea to be eaten? To the shores of Europe to be caged? to Camp Misery and Camp Remain Here? I ask you then, where? You tell me you are a poet. If so, our destination is the same. I find myself now the boatman driving a taxi at the end of the world. I will see that you arrive safely, my friend. I will get you there. Dios mío. After each review, I feel no words, and yet the words continue. The words keep us alive and give us hope. And I want to bring Elena Poniatowska in now. Um, if we can find her, there she is. Elena Poniatowska. Bienvenida, Elena. Muchísimas gracias. No te vamos a escuchar porque tienes que prender tu micrófono, por favor. Eh, si lo ven, está en la esquinita eh, eso, para poderte escuchar, Elena. Eh, quiero decir una cosa este, también para la, la este, participación de personas de México y de habla hispana. Elena, ah, este muy gentilmente uh, está de acuerdo por eh, hablar en inglés y es un poco un castigo, pero lo habla espléndidamente. Eh, yo me disculpo con ustedes, eh, pero la vamos a escuchar un poquito en español y le pedí a Elena leer un párrafo nada más del inicio de su gran libro Fuerte es el silencio, lo tengo acá, es este libro colección de ensayos y de testimonios eh, y creo que es muy importante que todo el mundo eh, es, la escuche así como hemos escuchado a, a Ilia y a Rita Dove y a Carolyn Forche en sus voces totalmente eh, increíbles cada quien escuchar a Elena Poniatowska porque los escritores escribimos en nuestro idioma y el, el español de Elena es muy, muy este, especial, extravagante, hermoso. So I'm just going to recap in English what I said. I've asked Elena Poniatowska, who's graciously agreed to do this conversation in, in English, to read one small paragraph in Spanish because her voice is so extraordinary. And I would like that we have this sequence that you all have heard Ilya Kaminsky, his English, Rita Dove's English, Carolyn Forche's English, and now Elena Poniatowska's Spanish. Even if you don't understand the language, you will, I am absolutely sure, realize that you're hearing a great writer reading from language that is not ordinary. Elena, adelante, gracias. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry not to speak in English because uh, I think the nuns who taught me English would be very sad if they didn't, uh, they, they would probably think she never learned anything, she can't speak English. But I'll speak Spanish because you asked me to. Well, I'll read you in Spanish, no? You can you turn up the volume any chance there, a little bit? It would be wonderful, really great. We would appreciate it so much. 
but it's going to be difficult because I'm I don't know where you do it. Okay. It's fine. Just go ahead. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna yell. Can you hear me if I yes. yell like a leader? No? Yeah, we hear you. Oh bueno. Pues póngale nomás Juan. Eh, como si con dar su nombre este temiera molestar. Espera, te me voy a poner los lentes. Temiera molestar. Ocupar un sitio en el espacio y en el tiempo que no les corresponde. No más, Juan. Al principio, cuando les preguntaba cómo se llama usted, venía el sobresalto. ¿Quién? ¿Usted? ¿Yo? Sí, usted. Pero póngale nomás, Juan, o lo que quiera. Sí, no me llamo, pero puedo responder a otro nombre, al que usted mande. Cualquiera es bueno. Me di cuenta que su quién equivale a nadie. ¿Quién anda allí? Nadie. Nadie contesta a la multitud. Todo regresa al silencio y todos lo nutrimos porque los que responden preguntando quién nunca han tenido derecho a nada, ni siquiera a que se les designe con un nombre. Toda su vida han sido un largo y continuo soportar que se les haga a un lado. That's all. Finished, finished. Gracias, Elena. Es estupendo. You don't have to hear for hours. <laughs> Brava. We could Brava. listen for hours. Thank you so much. This passage captures the portrait of someone being interviewed who almost doesn't care what it's name is used to, to speak to him. Maybe I can say what it is. Ah, bueno, adelante. Maybe if you want me to. I would love it. Because I think uh, I, this is a, uh, uh, these are Mexicans who lost their land, lost their houses, they have nothing, and they say, when I ask them, please give me, give me your name, they say, I don't have a name. Give me any name you want. Oh. You can explain. I'm sorry. No, no. That, that says just what I was going to say and um, leads to this question, really, for both you and Carolyn. Um, we hear it so much, especially in, in the poem, The Boatman, which is almost now, it feels like a companion piece to this extract from Elena's preamble to Fuertes el Silencio. Your attention going to those who would not otherwise, without you, rise into writing or rise into literature and therefore into our collective knowledge, our caring and into memory. So I guess one question that I have for both of you is, um, how did you become, choose to be a voice for others, if you feel you did that? <laughs> Elena. Oh, you look ready to speak. Well, I, I, I didn't choose. Uh, I took a path and it led there. I know that uh, James Baldwin said that history is not the story of illustrious individuals, but the story of millions of people living their lives collectively and experiencing their present. I know it's probably true for Elena too, because she we owe, owe her a great debt of giving us this testimonial form that wherever you go in the world, people are willing to tell you their stories on the condition that you will write about it and write the story. And this happened for me when I was in my early 30s. And it was difficult to reconcile with being a private lyric poet. 
And for it took me a long time to learn to live in both worlds and to allow my poetry to connect with that world of the testimonial. Do you feel, Elena, that you have inhabit two different worlds or that you've had to make a division between the the journalist voice and the writer of fiction? No, I think uh, uh, for me, people have always been, I've always uh, loved to speak to everyone in the street. I think it's an, a natural inclination. And I think it, it, it it's a way in Mexico, it's easy to speak to others. I don't think it's easy to do it in New York. I think no one cares and, uh, and the people go by you and there are multitudes of people that go by you and maybe if you fall down they'll pick you up. At least at my age they will help you. But uh, I, in Mexico people uh, think that maybe that's why you're here Magda because people care. People care for one another. Uh, the indifference, I think, has nothing to do with Mexico because of one, one real reason, because of poverty. Mm. I, 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 because of poverty and, besi and besides because, uh, because of uh, the personality of, of Mexicans is not to be a show-off, not self-assurance, not... Uh, a triumph, not vanity, not anything that has to do with, with, uh, for instance, with writing uh, writers in Europe or writers in, uh, the, in the United States. I think writers are becoming stars, or, mm -hmm. or they try to be stars. They want everyone to pay attention for them. I remember a writer who wrote about sex many years ago, an American writer, her name was Marilyn French, and when I saw her, she had a special car, a black car like this, uh, to pick her up. So vanity, for me, is linked to celebrity, and I prefer words of people who are not neither who are not celebrated and who don't take themselves as celebrities. <laughs> but of course, I'm very happy to meet you all. I <laughs> like your faces all. I suppose you are, I, I haven't read you all. I, I've read, but I, I still, I think, linked to, to women in many ways. I, I am a feminist and I, I really love women, especially if they get, if they're very young or very old, not in the middle. <laughs> I have a, another question. This is again for, for both of you, but particularly Carolyn, since you started out as a poet so young, probably not with this uh, narrative arc of the life you would then come into uh, once you uh, ventured away from home. Um, so in other words, that lyrical inner voice that you mentioned, um, do you feel now that it's it's come this long way with you? I know um, it's been said about your latest work that you are a literary reporter. So there's a way in which it oh, seems okay. that was Hilton Isles, right? Reviewing the latest book of poems, I think. Um, do you identify with that idea of being a literary reporter? Not in the journalistic sense. I don't have Elena's gifts to do journalism. I tried to, to write journalistic articles and my journalistic articles were very boring. <laughs> and so it wasn't until I found the form of, um, of narrative memoir that I found a way to write of the things I had seen in, in prose. And uh, so I'm not, um, I don't think I'm a reporter. I think I'm, I think I take in the world. It becomes things that become, go very deep inside me. Mm -hmm. Things that I remember and, re and people that I revere and listen to, they can't help but come to the page when I'm writing. I think, you know, if I tried to report on things, I could only do so 
as a metaphor, you know, the, the way that um, is a, the Polish poet um, uh, who wrote, Mr. Kojito, Ilya can help me with this, Zbigniew Herbert. Zbigniew Herbert has poetry where he says, I'm a reporter, I stick to the facts. But of course he's being ironic, you know, so. For me, it's we write out of I write out of my deepest obsessions, and they have become the condition of humanity, especially in this moment now in our time of of peril, as a species, all of us together going through this all over the world all at once. Uh, I think if one is obsessed with something, it will suffuse the work that you do. But I'm so interested. I met. I met you, Elena, in Tepoztlan at an Under the Volcano some years ago. I don't know if you remember, but it was I was so thrilled I could barely speak to you. Um, and I'm so interested in your testimonials and the way when you choose to do something in a testimonial and when you choose to do it in a novel. Can you t tell us about how that how that decision is made about your work? when you come to a point of wanting to write something? Well, yes, uh, it's, a bit, it's a difficult question because there is a difference. There is a difference, f first of all, in technology, because now interviews, when you speak to others, when you interview, you have a, a como se dice, una grabadora, a recorder. But, uh, and I think the recorder uh, hurts, uh, hurts writing. I think the recorder hurts interpretation. I think the recorder uh, doesn't, doesn't really uh, efface, what does he say? Borrar, borrar. Erase. Erases mm -hmm. in many ways. The, the, the other person, I remember Gabriel Garcia Marquez, telling me many years ago not to use a recorder ever, <laughs> just to listen to people and just to see their faces and, and listen to their whispering uh, and listen to their breathing, the way they breathe and the way they, they, they look at you because they also look at you. So this is, for me, this is, uh, it's to get everyone, uh, the whole person in yourself and in many ways become that person. Uh, I think this is uh, what one should do. I don't know. I, one should not do anything, no. But one should really uh, take in the other person. It's, uh, I, it may sound very corny, so I maybe I should stop. No, this is beautiful. It's exactly what I was hoping for I, I found that I started taking little photographs with my phone so I could remember a place. And then I realized that the phone was making me forget everything. And I only had the little picture left and I didn't have this place inside me. So I stopped doing that when I was trying to write, you know, I think it's like your recorder. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Before we open the floor to questions, because we could listen to you, I'm sure all of us, for the rest of time, um, I just wondered if you have anything going through your minds, both of you, about this moment that we're in. In other words, the pandemic. There's a great eagerness, uh, especially in the, in the U.S. at the moment, for people to just go back to quote unquote normal. And yet, I think most of us uh, are able to see that uh, not only have we been uh, crushed, <laughs> challenged uh, by this past year, but also if you read the science, it's not over. And so how do we live and write with uncertainty? Is this becoming uh, the kind of subject that suffuses who you are, Carolyn, and therefore how you write or what you write about. And same with you, Elena, just if you would each say a couple of things about that, and then we would like to give the audience a chance to ask you some questions. 
I think this is an incredible moment for humanity to come to become aware and to achieve clarity. It's important for us to know that 86% of the vaccines are being given to the people in the wealthy countries. And if we do not vaccinate and care for everyone in the global south, in the poorer countries, we are putting the world, we're not only failing morally completely, but we are putting the world in peril for variants and resurgences of this virus. And so, it, you know, I hate to make the argument that it's in our self-interest to care for the whole world and not be precipitous about going back to our so-called lives, you know, but rather to imagine that we are all interdependent as, as humans and none of us are going to be safe until everyone's safe. And that's true of every dimension of our society. Elena. Elena, well, what Carolyn says touches me very much because uh, uh, in Mexico, huge tents have been, have been settled, especially at the university, Universidad Nacional de Mexico. And it's uh, very touching to see the happiness of, at first it's all old people with white hair like me, and it's very, very touching to see the happiness, the satisfaction, really, of all these people. They are not, uh, not all these people are suddenly, uh, suddenly not noticed, but suddenly they are taken care for. Their attention, they, get, they are given a chair, mm -hmm. They are given a, a, an orange, they are given a bottle of water in a plastic bag, they are given a, a little piece of candy, a Mexican candy, which I can't translate into English. So suddenly they feel they are, and the vaccination is given by young people dressed like doctors. Of course, I think I'm surely most of them are doctors, or very young doctors, and this whole situation is a situation of giving attention to others. So this is the way I think we live in Mexico, this pandemic, no? It's attention to people who have never, well, not never, but who have not been cared for, who have not been, who are multitudes, no? Multitudes. Uh, a multitude has, has no face. So now we see faces and we see people, people smiling back. Mm. In terms of our writing, uh, Magda, I think we all live through this time. We are all passing through it. Our language is passing through it. Our consciousness is being formed by it. And later, our work will be marked by it. And there will be a trace of this year of isolation and, uh, and loss in our literature for decades to come, whether we are writing about it or not. I was going to say, we can't hear you. Mary, I do but... think that's so, so true. Uh, we're really running out of time. I uh, apologize, but we would like to just open the floor if people have questions for Carolyn or Elena, and then we're going to um, come up for a breath of air for about 30 seconds and go to our next presenters. So I'm not seeing questions. I'm not hearing questions, you can put them in the chat, which I can see, and we will pull them off. If there are questions that relate to what Carolyn has said, what Elena has said, or even a response uh, to one of the poets, um, we are happy to entertain them. Um, Magda, there's a question from Marianne Smith, that children in the US are having a peculiar addiction to their screens, iPads, etc. How shall we bring them back to quiet observing and listening to life without the screens? Would you like to answer that? <laughs> no. Well, um, it's a generation that has grown up with it. And that what I worry about is not only 
I, I worry of what they've never had, you know, moments of contemplation and meditation and being lost in the forest to things they've never had. And I think I still teach and I, I don't have any answers about this, but I can tell you one thing, these screens and everything that they, um, they do to us, they're structuring our consciousness. They are changing us yeah. as human beings. And so it's very dangerous. Uh, it, it's dangerous in terms of eroding our capacity to sustain contemplation. And I think poetry and literature, writing and reading aloud and slowly and making art is the antidote to this because you can't do it fast. You know, literature slows the mind. It makes us pay attention. And I think, I think deep attention is what we need to learn and practice and convey. My only answer to that one is writers write and we do now have a little avalanche of very interesting questions uh all at the last minute from some of the writers in under the volcano and i would like to just throw these out quickly um uh, diego is asking both of you how to translate the pain of others into my own writing elena <laughs> No, I, I no, I I want to listen. I I'd rather listen than answer questions, difficult questions like that. Especially a question about pain or suffering. I think uh, uh, I think uh, there's too much respect in seeing in 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 a person in seeing others suffering in order to be able to translate it. I don't think it has to be. I don't. I think there's. I would be very shy about it. I, I don't have an answer about translation. I agree with Elena. It's a question of um, developing our empathic imagination and dwelling in empathy, but we can never articulate the agony of another person. We can barely articulate our own. Of course. Of course, I'm I agree right. with Elena. Maybe we can leave with the word attention that Carolyn just brought into the conversation, because this is really uh, what it's all about for writers, isn't it? That you are in a state of attention, that you bring to your writing that level of caring and of accuracy, of acuity, of vision and hearing, whatever it is that you're writing about. And I think that the choices develop they take shape over time and then we come back to time how do you sustain over a life of writing or doing a commitment that is worth it and with that i would like to leave you all ask you if you would like to stand up stretch and remind everyone as we applaud those who have come now please stay in your space because we're about to welcome the biologist Valeria Sosa and the journalist Ginger Thompson, who will take this exact discussion forward, frame by frame. I want to thank you, Elena, for coming. I know it was difficult for you. We're very happy you decided to be with us in person. Thank you very much. Incredible. What a gift, all of you. And thank gracias, you. Gracias, Elena. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a todos. Te queremos. <laughs> so I wonder if we could now ask Ginger Thompson and Valeria Sosa to come forward in the way we come forward virtually, which will be by turning on your video and your uh, mic. And we'll, uh, we'll see um, each other. There we are. Fantastic, incredible. Uh, I don't think I can hear you, but could you just say hello so we know we, we can hear you? Hello, hello. Beautiful, beautiful. Buenas tardes. Bienvenidas. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really a movable feast, and uh, it seems almost like a travesty to leave the poets behind, but we are doing that as we move to talk to Valeria Sosa, who is a decades-long, award-winning, much-recognized biologist specializing in the origins of life, and Ginger Thompson,
who's one of the US most outstanding reporters. I'm gonna read you a tiny bit about each of them because I know that people often don't go clicking their way through the website, but there's so much more about each of them there. And I've had to condense, condense, condense because I said before, introducing people like this means that you have to either be quiet and just stand in awe or uh, condense madly into a little thumbnail sketch of someone who has done everything in their field. Uh, I'll start with Ginger. Ginger Thompson is the chief of correspondence now of ProPublica, which is one of the most extraordinary digital platforms doing long, fe long features or long-term investigative uh, coverage in the United States, across the United States. She's won a Pulitzer Prize for journalism. She was the Mexico City Bureau Chief for 15 years. Uh, and um, I can tell you that her Spanish is fantastic. She has exposed corruption uh, from both sides of the border. She has especially covered issues and policies involving immigration, political upheaval, and the fight against the drug cartels. She's won basically every major prize in journalism, and I can't keep up with her because every time <laughs> I turn around, there's another one. But I'll just tell you a few of the very well-known, the uh, Maria Moore's Cabot Prize, given at Columbia University, the Selden Ring Award, an Inter-American Press Association Award, and an Overseas Press Club Award. And I know I'm about two years behind. Um, she was also part of a team of reporters at ProPublica whose coverage of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy won numerous other awards. And in the spring of 2019, Ginger Thompson broke the story of young children being separated from their parents and held on the US border with Mexico, a story that I don't need to tell you is ongoing. Ginger's been recently guest faculty at New York's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University. And um, for us remains an honored member of our faculty because she helped to design under the Volcano's first investigative journalism program in 2018 as has remained a priceless <laughs> advisor as we continue to build that program out. And some of that group is here today. So Thanks. behold, Ginger Thanks. Thompson is back. Valeria Sosa is really, I should have said this, an evolutionary biologist, but she will elaborate on that because no matter what label I put on biologist, um, she'll say, well, yes, but. <laughs> So we're going to let Valeria explain her work momentarily. She has a lab um, at UNAM, the University of Mexico City, the main university, Universidad Autónoma de México. Y um, perdónenme porque he dejado de hablar español, me confundo. It's very hard to speak out of literally both sides of your brain and mouth. Pero voy a decirlo de más en español. También da clases, dirige su laboratorio. Y lleva más de 20 años conduciendo investigación en un lugar que se llama Cuatro Ciénagas. She has been conducting research for more than 20 years in the north of Mexico at Cuatro Ciénagas. Es un sitio único uh, that holds, this unique site holds microscopic forms of life that are continuous, meaning they go back to the very beginnings. And she will tell us also what that means and why it matters. Um, She's had fellowships from everywhere, the MacArthur Foundation, a National Conserv Conservation Award, the Aldo Leopold Fellowship awarded by the Woods Institute of Stanford, and in 2019 was named an international member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is, of course, as you all know, a huge honor. Valeria Sosa, who's also graciously agreed to speak in English, I should say. Valeria va a hablar en inglés, no se ofendan. Vive entre Mexico City y Tepoztlán and goes as often as she can to her beloved Cuatro Cienegas. Now, to launch into this unlikely combination, because I don't think biologists so often talk to journalists or vice versa, right? What I want to ask you about is really, what is it that has kept you, uh, well, you could say, Valeria, you're eyes into the microscope perhaps, but also digging in the earth for all of these years in Cuatro Cienegas, or you, Ginger, what is it that has made investigative journalism 
the work of your life? And how is that different from ordinary reporting? What does it mean to hold that, that kind of commitment? What's behind it? So if you would each just briefly address that question, I'll move on after to ask you more specifically about your work. Ginger? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's very gracious. Thank you. Sí, como so, no. Since I was a child, when I discovered the structure of DNA at 10 years old, I wanted to understand why and how such an elegant and simple structure hold it, all the secrets of life. And I was extraordinarily fortunate to have a life where I could dig into that question since 10 years old, so 50 years of, of scratching. Uh, and Cuatro Cienegas came into me, not me into Cuatro Cienegas. It's destiny, behold. Mm -hmm. uh, and NASA knocked the door and said, you have to look at this site. You understand evolution and ecology and microbes, and we need that. And so we arrived to Cuatro Cienegas, my husband, my two kids, and I in, in 99. And our life changed totally because the mystery, the beauty, the metaphors, the possibilities, and somehow, for me, the, the rocks are, are telling me poetry about stardust and comet soups uh, and how we became what we are. And Cuatro Cienegas is an amazing journey, and I'm very thankful for it. Wow. Because it holds the past and the future. We are saving Cuatro Cienegas through the kids and through consciousness. And that's amazing. So for me, um, you know, I became a journalist. I'm an army brat. I grew up in a family that traveled a lot. And as a child, it was hard, but as an adult, it became some, it became a bit of a passion of mine to travel and see the world. And I thought journalism was an opportunity for me to do that, to kind of give me a front seat on history, if you will. But early in my career, I had an experience where I was able to write about a woman who was being wrongly accused of a crime. And I was able to sort of write about the fact that she was being wrongly accused. I investigated the crime. She let me into her life. She was a, a very poor single mother who was terrified of speaking to a journalist. It took me a long time to win her trust. And when I did, and I was able to sort of write about what had happened from her point of view, it got the crime or get, got the accusations against her lifted. And that moment and that very first early story changed me. And I saw that journalism was a way to give power to people who didn't have it. Um, and, and so I've, you know, I've done a lot of different jobs in my career. I was a Mexico City correspondent for many years for the New York Times. But I've always looked for opportunities to use my journalism to empower people who are otherwise, you know, not heard powerless um, in front of institutions or systems that are causing them harm. And so investigative journalism, it has been my way uh, of doing that. And that's why this kind of reporting, which isn't all that different than what you would call regular reporting, it just, with investigative reporting, you're often allowed to stick with a story for a longer period of time, to spend more time looking for facts and information that exposes harm. And, um, and so, you know, um, you know I've, I'm following in trails that were blazed by women like Elena Poniatowska, whom I'm so proud to be here and to have been able to listen to her. And I just want to say that. Thank you. I Thank hope you, Ginger. I wonder if we go back to Valeria and take up this thread that Ginger just mentioned about the story of the story and how realizing that what you do has the power to carry out into the world stories that wouldn't otherwise be told and even to bring about change. Because the little that I've 
seen a Cuatro Cienagas. I haven't yet been lucky enough to go there. Um, it seems to me that you, what you see there is a very, very big story. Can you tell us a little more about what's there? Because I hear rocks, I hear stardust. And so I realized that you are reaching from deep into the earth and that the story goes to the sky, which we'll be looking at tomorrow when we're visited by Priya Nataranja and the astrophysicist talking about black holes. So I love the scope of what you're suggesting, but I would like to hear what you have to say about that and why you're still digging. So I don't know if I can share my screen and, and give you a very fast story. Let's we hope so. Share. You should be able to. Yes. And if you can't, we'll make it happen. Aiva. Now, here it is. So Cuatro Cienegas is, is an amazing, beautiful place. It's a place where mountains lift off and, and bend and form heart shapes, like 3,000 meter high. Uh, and uh, we arrived there because NASA was interested in, in Cuatro Cienegas being the most diverse place for stromatolites. And stromatolites are rocks striper rocks, but they are the oldest fossils that we know on Earth. And they are the oldest communities. And so Cuatro Cienegas, they are alive and kicking, and they are very diverse. And not only that, they are the food of all kinds of animals. And that's unique in more, most of the world. And so what I have discovered in 20 years of working in Cuatro Cienegas, here's the view of this amazing mountain called San San Marcos y Pinos, it looks like a starship. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the nose of a huge dinosaur. And it has stored in its belly the story of life on Earth. In its inside sediments, in the inside rocks. And the reason why we can tell it is because it has fire in the belly, deep down. So how we know those things? We know because we can see the stromatolites. They, they make the reefs of the past, but also the reefs in the present. And here, in between my fingers, we have the history of life on Earth. And that's quite humbling. Because in the, in the deepest layer, we have the first metabolism on Earth. That's the metanogens. That is a very, very simple metabolism. Then we have all kind of sulfur using molecules that, that build life for a hot planet. And then the miracle of photosynthesis, the early photosynthesis was purple and deep green and didn't broke water because it was low energy, low frequency. Uh, and the ancient bacteria hide in the water in the orange ocean because UV light was not stopped by, by ozone layer. And then these filaments, very thin filaments, are the cyanobacteria, the ones that discover how to break the water in order to free the oxygen. And bubble by bubble, change the planet forever. So we are here thanks to this small slice of mud cake. And then a little grass and my fingers tell the rest of the story. Here we are. Mm. Here we are thanks to these little creatures that change the metabolic signature of all Earth, even if they are minuscule. Uh, and the reason why Cuatro Cienegas store it is this magma that is in the belly of the mountain and probably is an um, anomaly deep on Earth. I like to think that is is kind of the cradle of, of early life. Uh, and we know it's an anomaly because with the molecular signature of the creatures we find in Cuatro Cienegas, we can go all the way back. In this case, it's aerobic bacillus and they need oxygen. So we cannot go further than when the ocean turned blue. And it turned blue 600 million years ago because the animals make holes. And when the animals were greedy and want to have more food and start to dig holes, they, they release the nutrients that were beneath the marine sediment and then the algae went up and all that was caused by the stromatolites causing a global freezing that liberates the phosphorus that was stored in the rocks. So 
all those stories of, of animals, of creatures, of rocks and ice are hidden behind it, inside this mountain. And we think is kind of, of the treasure cove. Life was molded along with, with the mountain when it uplifted in the Cretaceous. Uh, and clay and slate mold together and make these little, little tiny caves where the minerals and the bacteria and microbes stay. And so when the heat takes them up, they have a sun life and then water drips down and refills the wetland. And they have a mountain life. Most of their times it's a mountain slow life. Nobody cares, they are slowly evolving. There's no way to stop evolution. But we are draining the wetland. We are killing the, the time machine because we're greedy and this is beautiful place. Turin is now dead, dead, dead. Cadavers everywhere. But we have hope because if we stop hoping, we will stop living. And the hope is the children. And we've been working 10, 20 years with the young children to raise consciousness through art. And then with the high schoolers to raise consciousness to the power of science. And they are the owners of the genetic resources of the land. And they are transforming the way everybody sees the land because they're explaining the elders how to use the water in the desert and how to use it wisely for them to have a life. And I'm so proud that a river was reborn in October last year because these kids took the power of their action to stop a channel to drain their land and, and retake the river to wet the wetland. And now it's 40 hectares long, seven kilometers long, uh, and it's a miracle of the transformation of the power of consciousness and education. And here this kid, who is now an adult, was wide-eyed, 14-year-old, when he saw his first stromatolite, and now he's a PhD in biotechnology, and he's the leader of the project of biotechnology for the people in Cuatro Cienega. So there's a lot of hope. We can transform the world one side at a time as the stromatolites build that bubble by bubble. Hmm. We have a blue planet. Valeria, a simple question here, um, and then we'll turn to Ginger, because this is a great example of a story worth pursuing. Are you saying, in effect, that this site is a unique laboratory and that there is continuous life inside it Yes. Yes. And from what yeah. I understood, you had to do a huge campaign to protect it and preserve it. Is that correct? Lion. Yes. So the research has gone hand in hand with, with political action and education altogether. Yes. That's There's right. no way to, to slice one from the other because we are part of this politica persona. And, and the scientist in me needs to communicate in order to, to explain why do I care. Exactly. It's so not, so is, there, is there any anything, Valeria, anything that in all of these years, if you could say one sentence, anything that has surprised you and your team that you discovered that you didn't know about these proto forms of life? Well, hmm. when we arrived to Cuatro Cienegas in 99, the naturalist who, who discovered Cuatro Cienegas, Dr. Minkley, was the one who dragged NASA there because he believed that the ocean was there once upon a time and that survived. And we didn't believe him. And when we saw the first molecular evidence of the ocean being there, mm. and not since the Jurassic, but since the Precambrian, it was a wow moment. He was right. So this is why you're still there, Yes. correct? Correct. Okay, I don't want to cut you off, but I would just like to come back to Ginger. Would you say anything about sort of your current work, where you put the energy, where do you feel, what are the stories? Everything seems to be ramifying so much and we're in a state of you know multiple traumas in the US and in Mexico, uh, how does one, how does one choose and how do you personally 
uh, choose what you're going to write about next? Um, yeah, that's a really uh, tough question. You know, I I am currently working on stories that are, are incredibly new to me, subjects that are incredibly new to me. I think, you know, um, once we entered this pandemic last year, um, all of ProPublica pretty much turned its attention to writing about the pandemic. And so have I. Um, and I began sort of following one, an outbreak in one particular place. Um, there is this town in Southern Georgia called Albany, Georgia. And for a time there, it had the fourth highest number of cases in the world. And it's this tiny town, tiny as 75,000 people in Southwest Georgia. And it is a largely African-American town. And if you, know, you all were watching the pandemic unfold in the United States, there were sort of different waves of understanding of the pandemic. And the first wave was that we were getting hit. The second wave was that some of us were getting hit harder than others. And those some of us were people of color, um, including African-Americans. And so then the next question we began asking at ProPublica is why? Why are African-Americans and people of color being so disproportionately affected by the pandemic? And so. I was sort of asking those questions as I was watching virtually because I wasn't able to travel to Albany right away. Um, and so I would sign into Facebook pages. The city was holding public hearings about the pandemic online. I could actually kind of be a sort of fly on the wall and watch a lot of events that were unfolding in Albany online. Um, so it was a hotspot for the pandemic. It was a place where this question of African Americans and being disproportionately affected was sort of playing out. Those questions were playing out. And one of the things that began to sort of get talked about um, in terms of the impact on African Americans is that they suffer high rates of what we now call comorbidities, high rates of hypertension, high rates of diabetes, high rates of a lot of very preventable um, illnesses and conditions. And so then we said, okay, why are they doing that? Why is, why is it that black people in this country are so sick? And the questions inevitably were answered in the healthcare system, right? And the disparities in how African-American communities are served or ill-served by the healthcare system. And in Albany, Georgia, there is one hospital and it dominates the healthcare system in this very um, you know, remote corner of Southwest Georgia. It is one of the poorest congressional districts in the country and has one of the most powerful healthcare systems in the country. And I'm thinking, how can a place with such a powerful healthcare system have such a sick population? And, you know, that question on its own was very compelling to me. And then you just do a little bit of history, looking at the history of Albany, and it, it sealed my interest in that. Albany, Georgia was this place where in the, at the turn of the century um, in 1900, 1898, 1900, W.E.B. Du Bois traveled there to write about and, and study the conditions of African-American life in America. And that's where he wrote two chapters of his um, you know, epic book, The Souls of Black Folk. And so feeling like I was gonna possibly be following in some of his footsteps, writing about the founder of the hospital, the man who paid to, to uh, found the hospital, to establish the hospital that I'm writing about, met W.E.B. Du Bois. And this hospital was founded at about that same time. So this story has, it, is very rich with history. Um, and it 
it asks this question, which I think is a very central question in this country at this time, and allows us to, in one place, with one healthcare system and one community of people, really try to tell the story of race, tell the story of the healthcare system, tell the story of disparities in treatment, um, and, and just sort of, um, I don't know, I'm speaking too much, but basically, that has been sort of the, that, that's been the focus of my um, investigation over the last year. So I'm hoping to write um, a story. We're doing a film connected to this piece and hopefully it will all come out sometime later this year. Not this escucho, you know. It's such an incredible example of what investigative journalism can do, which requires the resources to put a team in place, to go back, to have the luxury of time. And of course, um, what you're describing is taking a place as a kind of laboratory, um, but seeing it that way. I mean, it has to be seen first to be taken that way, right? And right. then you have it opening out and yeah. that's not to make unequal comparisons, but it does feel a bit analogous to what Valeria was describing with Cuatro Absolutely. Cienegas. Absolutely. go where there is a, a story and the two of you go where the story is big, big and interesting and has implications sort of outside its own perimeter in a way. Isn't that true? Yeah, it's now, resonant. We look for things that are resonant, uh, you know, so Albany is a story in which we hope we'll be able to show it's representative of what's going on in the healthcare system across the country, right? And so very much like Valeria's work in Cuatro Cienegas. It's this place where you can tell the story of the world, but in one, in one place. This is the best kind of ambition. Um, I hate to cut you off, but we would like to give a moment or two for questions and or comments. Uh, the audience has been extremely excited all through uh, this conversation today. And what I'm picking up is a sense of fascination um, and that they're taking away a notion someone has called here radical curiosity, which seems like a great way mm -hmm. uh, for us to, um, to leave this. Uh, there's so many more questions I think we're at the edge, the outer edge of our allotted time, but I will ask uh, the hidden um, puppeteers whether we can stay on a little longer if people would like that. Can we? Send me a message. Sure. <laughs> ah, they have spoken. So in that case, um, yeah, in that case, I am checking uh, the list of questions here. Yeah, um, people people are curious about the political action that you organized in Cuatro Cienegas. Valeria, if you want to say anything briefly again, um, given especially this this uh, person is asking the anti-science climate yeah. that is prevailing in the U.S. at the moment. Of course, this well, in well in Mexico, there's not such an anti-science. Uh, as U.S., we are very different. As Elena explained, we, we are from a different branch, probably. Uh, but is there's a problem with the government that the woman who is in charge of the science in Mexico, I know her since college, we studied together. She has her own agenda and not the agenda of everybody. And her agenda is she is blessed by some kind of illumination and the rest of us we are just privileged brats who want our money for buying the newest machine which is not true we do science with masking tape literally and nevertheless we publish in the best journals and it's it's a a feat of of faith that we work with amazing students UNAM is an amazing house that shelter us all. And we work where we have, but instead of Elena protecting science in Mexico as she is a scientist and she's a top scientist, 
she's only protecting herself. And that's very selfish. And, and the scientific community resent that. But the fact, as Elena showed, that thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were vaccinated in, in the last month because we have faith in science. There's much fewer anti-vaxxers in Mexico. They are just the hipsters or the ones who don't understand that there is in the United States. But I think we scientists, we need a voice clear and loud to explain what we do and why we do it. And for me, Cuatro Cienegas has been an example of how to raise that voice for the social justice and the future of those kids. So you have been a science advocate, really. Yes. I know you've also written a lot and you believe in, in sort of getting the story out. Uh, we're going to do a journalism workshop in January specifically focused on reporting science because it's clear if this is not a genre, this is an emergency. It is. There, there is just a crying urgent need for people to understand the importance of science and the scientific method as well as to be literate in what is now happening to all of us. I mean, we're walking around and we suddenly we, we, we notice that we've become a human Petri dish. And maybe we always were, but we didn't know it until Corona came along. So, yeah. um, and I have learned that the world hypothesis that is very natural to scientists is very finicky in people that don't understand science. So are you telling me this is true or just you think it's true? And that's the basic point that we need to bring forth. I want to um, read out another question that's specifically for Ginger uh, from one of our participants this year, who says, uh, and I know you've heard this before, uh, it's a bit challenging to get pitches accepted these days for investigative pieces. Many outlets stick to their usual contributors and it's rather difficult for upcoming journalists to get their foot in the door. Any tips? For example, he says when there are good topics such as Cuatro Cienegas. So, you know, I think I think pitching is one of the most complicated things we do. And um, I you know I, I I think what's really important is right off the top, you need to try to communicate to whoever you're pitching to that you're going to tell them something they don't know, that they, they don't, you're going to reveal something that the public doesn't know well, or they don't know it the way that you're going to tell it, right? Um, you know, when I wrote about a cartel massacre in Mexico, in Allende, right? I wanted people to know right away that they were going to read a story in a way they've never read about cartel violence in Mexico. Unfortunately, we all know cartel violence in Mexico happens way too often and has taken far too many lives. But this attack in Mexico was different. And I was going to write about it in a different way. And I wanted my readers to know from the, from the moment they started reading this, that it was going to be something different and that they were going to learn something different about what drives the violence in Mexico, that it's not just cartels, that there are governments involved, including the United States government was involved in triggering that massacre. And so when I pitched it to my editors, I pitched it by saying, you don't know how deeply involved the United States government is in triggering cartel violence in Mexico. That we have, we, we kind of knew it in the abstract, but I had an example and I was gonna be able to bring to life an example of what that looked like. And we were gonna tell it in an oral history where I was not gonna narrate the story. I was going to report this story in a way that the people who had experienced this violence and who had contributed to triggering the violence were going to tell the story. And that was not anything, no one has done really in, you know, since Elena probably investigative oral histories. And so we really, so I think 
it's really important because it's incredibly competitive right now, you need to tell an editor immediately, you don't know this, or you don't know it in the way that I'm going to tell it. This is going to be new to you and your readers. That cuts through a lot of the sort of, you know, denial. Make clear in the first paragraph that this is new, that this is different. Everyone today, from the poets to Elena to Carolyn and to Valeria and Ginger, has talked in each their own way about revelation, about revealing something and about realizing as a researcher, as a writer, as a poet, as a journalist, that you have the power to bring something over. And um, I couldn't have asked for anything more inspiring. Uh, there are more questions than we have time for. And we, um, we will bring you back <laughs> when we're live in Teposlan and mm -hmm. can take this whole thing forward because I, this is an amazing group to be talking with and uh, speculating with and looking ahead with. And six months from now, we'll know a little more than we do today about where some of this is heading, but not everything. Um, we're going to close now with a reading from Cyrus Cassells, who did manage to finally get here, and we're so glad to have him uh, to bring some closing poetry to this event. And before um, that, I will just uh, say a few words. Cyrus, as the other poets, uh, has received so many awards and has published so many books. Um, please look on our website for more of his profile. Cyrus is on our poetry faculty now for the second year and is leading our poetry masterclass in English. So with that capsule reduced description, I give the floor now to Cyrus Cassells. Bienvenido Cyrus, welcome, gracias. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. I have never been delayed for reading in my entire career, but here I am. I wanted to share a poem that I began in Tepatzlan a year ago it's a poem about Garcia Lorca's desire to come to Mexico, which as many of you know, is thwarted by the start of the Spanish Civil War. It'll be about three minutes and it's in three parts. And it's called, If Lorca Had Lived in Morelos. The first part is called The Hummingbird. Minus a fluttering truce flag or a gypsy's rosemary sprig, revenant singer, Andalusian ghost, you linger, a hummingbird, at caressing dusk. So then in a lush walled winter garden in Tepotlan, in a tropical hush, I'm reminded you perished. No strike that word, we're assassinated at dawn with two tickets to Mexico and a jerry built plan to construct a new life with your kept quiet lover. In a match burst I recall climbing to the place you were taken from us a galaxy of sturdy pines and garrulous scotch broom, where I found your giveaway poems pinned with small pilgrim left stones shaped as a horizontal cross. My phantom Federico, when I returned to the infamous gully the following March, newborn Andalusian spring, but with snow still resting on the Sierra's crest, I found the poignant poetry cross fully immersed in rainwater and now in a sultry jungle twilight, as I consider your bullet riddled final day, I want to cry out furious, aggrieved, riveted by the telltale messiahs, the countless prophets, by all the beautiful worlds you might have become. Two, lovers on the brink of war. Poet, you chose Mexico because probity and ambushing love demand a haven a kingdom clean of danger and intolerance. Visionary, you chose passage to Veracruz because romance deserves cicadas and regal bougainvillea, not menacing fists and shouts, not bickering Spain's crimson marksmanship. Seer, in a midsummer of armed revolt, you dreamed of Mexico and chose to patiently wait for fledgling Juan's permission to leave his family. O oh, love invisible for 70 years, revealed in a bonanza of stashed verse and yellowed letters, so that now we glean 
like the green all sing moon and olives, your clandestine waiting for one cost you your life. Three, a couple in Tepotzlan, newfangled magi, new world lovers, you live the kaleidoscopic life, you and your lion maned Juan of La Mancha, always imagined, singing, if Lorca had lived in Morelos as an Afra, as Eureka, as Mantra and Magic Juan, a gossipy version of you in a pheasant gray fedora, coming the market stalls, bargaining in a winsome t-shirt for Juan, in modest but beguiling Morelos, pregnant with unlimited color, with rambling Sabbath sorcery and pre-Columbian grace. Morning seekers, you treasure the hail Chacaranda Tepoztlan, the able handiwork of jovial sand sandal makers. Ghosts of Lorca and Juan, listen, your pledge to the inn men, lauding buskers treading slanting streets, both dazzled by these all-star acrobats, workaday Spartans bearing phenomenal sombreros, nimbly balancing so many life-giving loaves of bread. Thank you, everyone. Iris. So gorgeous, so gorgeous. Thank you. You've brought my all-time hero, Lorca, to Teposlan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. I just remind you again that we are on tomorrow with another <laughs> incredible group of presenters, the astrophysicist uh, Priya Natarajan and three novelists, Alberto Chimal, our very own Alberto Chimal from Mexico, who's also on our faculty, and Victor Laval, who has also come to Tepoztlan, a uh, novelist from New York, and Annalie Newitz, a science writer and sci-fi writer, all talking about black holes. So have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you are. And thank you so much to our fantastic hidden crew, uh, Hector Massin and Ricardo Morales. And Gabby, if you're here, please uh, come back and say <laughs> hello and goodbye in Spanish. I am here. I am thrilled, thrilled to um, to share. I, I, I'm going to say this in Spanish. <laughs> Estoy muy eh, conmovida y muy agradecida de ver esta muestra justamente de cómo eh, la ciencia, la poesía, el conocimiento, el activismo se entrelazan para construir otra clase de mundo. Muchísimas gracias por, eh, por estar aquí. Gracias por eh, participar con sus excelentes preguntas y efectivamente nos vemos mañana en esta conversación que tendrá como eje eh, un poco de lo que vimos hoy también, la imaginación, la ciencia y la especulación en torno a esta, eh, pues a esta forma de abordar el mundo eh, a partir de estas epistemologías. Muchas gracias y nos vemos mañana a la misma hora a las 12.